I'd like you to give me your name and your date of birth. I'm Harold Baker Steele. I was born in the summertime, the 8th of July, 1922. Can you tell me who your parents were? My parents were, my mother was Georgia Baker Steele and my dad was Forrest George Steele. Okay. And I would also, uh, out of, uh, to be more exact, I was born in Sublette, Illinois, which is in Lee County. Born in Sublette because my mother had heard that this was a place where a special doctor who had created something called twilight sleep so a mother could actually enjoy birth. So I became a joyous <laughs> first birth to my parents. Well then, can you tell me about this farmstead? Yes. My great-grandfather came to Dover in 1848 at, with his siblings and his widowed mother. They came from the state of Ohio where his father had been accidentally killed in the woods. I don't know if the head came off the axe or just what happened, but why they came to Dover we don't know, but nonetheless that was then a village of 600 people. And he purchased 80 acres in 1874. And his oldest son, my grandfather, then started farming here in 1873, 1873, started farming in 1874. How many acres? He bought 80 acres in that first tract. How many acres does this farm consist of? Right On now? this particular farm is 220 acres. Okay. It's primarily a, what kind of a farm? When I grew up, it was a diversified farm, as was true with most of agriculture in Illinois and across the nation. Some differences, of course, when you go to the west, but diversified in that we had a rotation of two years of corn, next year seeded in oats seeded to alfalfa or clover. We had livestock and grain, and the livestock consisted of a dairy herd, hogs, and a lot of chickens, and uh, potato patch showed me it was a field. We raised our own fruit and vegetables. And the only time that we, my mother and dad needed money was to buy flour and sugar and salt and pepper and coffee and that sort of thing where we had raised all the other things. Then they would barter the eggs that we didn't use and sell the cream that we didn't use to cover the groceries. We call that diversified agriculture. And that was true since the pilgrims came. And even before the pilgrims, the first settlers from Europe were certainly diversified agriculture up until about World War II. Then it changed dramatically to a business and specialization. Your father had given you some advice about farming uh, that you shared with me some time ago about hogs in particular. Could you share that advice? Well, Dad, grew up on his farm. He was 100% farmer from a young lad until he retired. At, he, he so loved agriculture and he loved the kind of farming that I've just described. So when my wife and I came home and we were married overseas, he said, Harold, the only advice I'd give you as you farm is don't get married to a bunch of dairy cows. And so I took that advice, <laughs> uh, but he had a work ethic. He didn't have to explain it to me. We grew up with that work ethic. He had great management skills, and he also created and developed another skill of investing his money, any excess money, and he could wring it pretty tightly to not waste he would, he would invest in the stock market. And his one brother, his life was fed in Chicago as a life insurance agent. And from when I was a youngster, I would hear my dad discussing the business of life insurance with investment. And he'd say, Andrew, you're, you're short suiting those that buy life insurance from you because you should extend to the, explain to them they can make more by investing their money in the stocks and bonds and they can buy life insurance. Everyone's going to die, but you prepare yourself for death by investing and creating a larger degree of wealth. So I remember those discussions so well, but I'm afraid I violated that principle <laughs> in my own life. You uh, uh, 
join the military, or were, were you were you drafted? No, I, I uh, in my sophomore year at the University of Illinois, I enlisted. I'd taken. I was involved then in the second year of uh, ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, and uh, by I enlisted. And that class then was permitted to spend one more year at the university, and then we all went on active duty. So I did enlist and went active duty. And where did you serve? I was, uh, I first I was, uh, first went active duty, went over to Michigan to start my training, then Fort Sill, Oklahoma in the artillery, then back on campus under the Army Specialized Training Program because the United States leadership at that time believed fervently that we were short of engineers and we needed to create and develop and educate a, a, quite a core of good engineers in our nation. But after we'd been there for, I suspect, about uh, oh, half a semester, they decided to add all the engineers they needed and we bet back to Fort Sill and the artillery. And just as I were going to go into training for officer candidate, in the artillery, uh, up until that time I'd been on a gun crew, the old French 75 millimeters. They decided they'd had all the artillery officers they needed and they needed more infantry. So we were shipped into Fort Benning, Georgia, basic training in infantry and then officer candidate school in the infantry, graduated from that school then in October 1944. So I was in training from June 1943 in active duty until October 44, and this whole period of time covered the area I've just explained as being trained in those both artillery and infantry. Where did you serve in, in Europe? Then so I joined the 83rd uh, the 89th Infantry Division in North Carolina, and they were in their final training for combat, and we then shipped overseas December 1944 uh, to Europe heading for England, and we were in convoy, about 36 ships, heavy seas the whole trip. So it took us 12 days to make the trip in those heavy seas. And during that particular period of time, the bulge broke loose. This was the Germans' last fervent, desperate attempt to hold back the Allied forces. And they lined up their power and penetrated the American forces, you know, they're in Belgium. And so our division then was diverted from landing in Eng England to landing in La Havre, France. And then we debarked at night from the ships, going, getting ready to go up into combat, but our artillery hadn't arrived. So we had to stay and train some more, waiting for artillery. So we actually got into combat there in, uh, in along Belgium and France. You yeah, met, Germany. You met your wife uh, in uh, in Europe. Yes. Now after after hostilities, war was over, and uh, we then moved our division back into France. We were processing troops going to the European, going to the uh, domestic, back to the states, and also being shipped to uh, the Far East. To get ready to fight penetration and invade Japan, so we were processing those troops, and uh, that that was from when the war ended in May until October. The mission was completed, and then I was transferred to the 83rd Division in Lower Austria, with headquarters in Linz, and uh, then I was then transferred again into Vienna as Chief Agent Criminal Investigation of uh, headquarters United States forces in Austria. General Mark Clark was in charge. And on a blind date, I met my sweetheart. How long have you been married now? We were married uh, overseas in Vienna in October 1946. And so this October will be 62 years. What was her, why was she there in Europe? What was the... Uh Margie was from New York City. She grew up in Upper State, New York, and after graduating from high school, she lived in New York City. And as she tells the story, I wondered, what can I do 
to serve my country. So he said the men on the street were either couldn't be couldn't serve because they uh, may have had a a very important job for defense or physically handicapped or really old. So she said, what can I do to help the country? And she went to uh, the War Department to make some discoveries and uh, found out something about OSS, the Office of Strategic Service. This was counterintelligence, and this was the nation's very first attempt and very first successful attempt to gain counterintelligence to help in a war effort. And this intelligence gathered and would be used to help our armed forces in many very important moves that they were making strategically for the armed forces. And she flew then, trained in Washington as a cryptographer. And she and five or six other ladies then flew from New York over to North Africa, served in North Africa, Egypt, and then eventually then in uh, in, uh, Joe, she'll have to tell you the story. One other nation, uh, Greece, served in Greece. Then, of course, when the war ended, OSS had completed its mission and CIA was developed. She then went to Vienna and served with General Clark in the headquarters there in Vienna. So that's how you met? Yes, we met then in Vienna. Okay. And uh, that was. Uh, uh, quite a change of life from serving in uniform uh, in combat to working with his people in civilian life and to maintain order uh, and investigate murder cases and so forth that we were responsible to. And now I met this lovely lady, so I had a rounded life and uh, we, we've just enjoyed uh, not only the Austrian people at that time, but we had opportunity of getting to be acquainted with another class of people, namely the Soviets who were communists and socialists. So we got to see, you know, as Americans, we take many things for granted. Freedom. Freedom's a word we use by rote. But there we truly learned what freedom did mean. We saw the other imbalance of nations who believed that the top leadership of the nation was, quote, the God, and the people, the civilians, were only a, a, a method of gaining, quote, God's objectives in plan, on planet Earth. And it was a rude, wide awakening to us. We're going to get back to this in a little bit, but uh, you brought your wife, who was really a city person, to the country. Uh, and back to farming. What was that like? Well, I'd first tell you, Don, that I called home, and it was seldom you could get a phone, and it was very expensive. So I called home, and this household was on a party line. I expect there were eight or ten people on this line, and I called home to tell Dad and Mother that I would going to be married. And uh, Dad answered the phone. And after he answered the phone, I could hear click, 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 when the neighbors all picked up their phone, too. I said, Dad, I can hardly hear you. He said, just a minute, Harold. Now, folks, if you'd all hang up, I could hear, by, and hear I could listen to Harold much better than I'll call you each back and let you know what the message was. And click, click, click. So they, they all hung up, and Dad and I could converse. So he said, Dad, I won't be married. Yes. And our name's Marjorie Whiteley. Yes. And uh, she's from New York City, and then it was quiet. New York City! So that was the rude awakening to the family of what had gone wrong with my accountability because they knew that unless I changed my mind, I truly was going to be dedicated to the, to the farm. I really wanted a farm. On the same time, Margie called her mother in New York, and her comment was, a farmer! So there was this anxiety, I'm certain, with both of our sets of parents that uh, that's a real big question there. There's certainly Marjorie going to have many, many changes in life than she did, but she has been a, a great sport in, in adopting to this new way of life, and she really loves it in the country. Let me pause for just a second here, gentlemen. And, uh, and uh, don't, uh, 
you know, just... Do you want to get back into combat any? I'm probably going to save that to Mark Depew. Okay. I really, uh, I think okay. that's going to, that's, right. I think that is a huge story in itself. Okay. And uh, I wish I could explore it right now. <laughs> We're good to go again. You'll and also, one more, clip, please. one more hand clap, please. Thank you. Also, I don't know if you want to cover this, but in Vienna, with CID, uh, I think I told you where we did take this couple, the greatest ballet dancer of all time, us, got him out of Vienna back in the American zone. But we probably want to cover that another time. Oh, I'm going to tell us a little, a little bit about that. Uh, I better get my uh, thought pattern as to what his name is first. Uh, um, I hate to waste film time trying to remember her name, but uh, it, you know it's one of those things where you... Uh, I'll tell you what, if it comes to you, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll just go ahead and, 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 and tell us about it. Okay. What I wanted to, to get to was uh, uh, moving back to the farm after World War II, what changes that you saw, and basically how your wife kind of integrated into the, to the farm community. You know, I was, actually, I left the farm to go down to university in 1940. And I'd be home then just in the summertime in 41, 42, 43, I left for the Army. So basically, uh, there were about seven years when I wasn't here at the farm. Uh, seven years of a far different life. So I lost track of some of the things that my father had been doing. We did have a threshing run. When I was a youngster, there may maybe 20 different farmers on this threshing run. But probably when I was up uh, in grade school, my father and five other neighbors decided to scale down the size and they bought their own threshing machine. And uh, originally, I started out as a water boy carrying water. In high school, I carried bundles. I drove the team and, and carried bundles from the field up to the threshing machine. And uh, that was a period of time uh, where neighbors worked together. When we shell corn, we have a steam engine bring the sheller in. And neighbors would come and we'd shell corn. And we in turn would help others shell corn. It was a time when if you were sick and couldn't work, the neighbors would rally together and come and help. That was the kind of life that we lived. And in the winter time, like the winter of 1936, very cold, a lot of snow, a lot of wind, and the snow might be six and eight feet deep on the roadway. And the neighbors had come together to scoop shovels and scoop it out. And it was so deep that they'd make ledges and one would scoop up here and the one up here would throw it out. And then you'd go to town in convoy. And you'd come back in convoy so if the roads closed you'd help one another. So that was a life I was used to. So we came back to the farm. Some of that was being changed to the extent that We no longer had a thrashing run. You had a combine. You no longer helped neighbors shell corn. You had your own equipment in that you hired someone that specialized in this. And you had, it was more mechanical. So machines were starting to become a greater factor in less labor, more productivity with the use of machines. And I remember in those first years I was farming, we raised pigs in the wintertime in the hog house, the old hog house, and you used heat lamps. Now, we didn't ever do this before. You had a pot-bellied stove in that hog house, and I still use that pot-bellied stove, and I slept out in the hog house at night with the hogs with these heat lamps. And it was one step toward what we know today is as confinement hog operation. That was the first step. You, you stepped out in the hog with a heat light. 
So it was gradual changes, but at the same time, some of these changes were rather dramatic. When we came with a combine, that did away with the binder, that did away with shocking oats, that did away with pitching the bundles back on a wagon, running them through the thrashing machine and blowing the straw into a barn or a straw stack outside. You put them, you not only had the thrashing machine, uh, excuse me, the combine, but you also then had a baler. And fewer, less work, less work, but more technical. You had to know more about the mechanical aspect. And you had to be sharper with the labor force that you did have because you had to utilize it to form more efficiently. Uh, then, as 1960, we started becoming involved in confinement hog operation. So I would maybe drive uh, 100 miles south, talk to George Brower or Russ Jekyll. Of course, they were the leading edge in confinement hog. And they started not with a book. There wasn't any book. They couldn't go to university. They didn't know either. No one knew. No one. No one at all on earth knew how to go to confinement. So they had to develop the housing, the breeding, the genetics, the nutrition, air movement, so that the environment within that unit was an advantage to be more efficient in pork production raise more pigs per litter. You do it more efficiently in conversion of feed grains and protein into pork, the kind of pork that the consumer wanted. We would go to Chicago and meet with the processors and say, what kind of pork do you really want? And they'd explain. They wanted more lean meat. They wanted larger, more full hams, a larger loin eye. Will you pay a premium for it? When you produce the quality, will you pay a premium? Well, if you'd start paying a premium now when we have some quality, this would instill in us a greater desire. So you'd have this interplay. You know, what's first, the hen or the egg? And so you went through this little diabetical sort of thing. Now, see, I mentioned 1960. Well, that went into 1970, about a 10-year period before there was some really assemblance of the kind of environment that really went to the buildings. Now, my son's born. Greg born in 1947. He's in 4-H. We talk about 4-H, FFA. He goes to Vietnam, he comes back, ready to farm. Talk about going to confinement. I said, Greg, pork Production confinement is safe for the farmers. Now, we know it's gone with the poultry producers. The business interest created a top-down management style. They've taken pork, the, excuse me, poultry production from the farmers, and now they have it. And as a farmer, you'll sign a contract to produce chickens. But we don't do that. We're in hogs. And this is far more technical. They can't possibly become involved. Little did we know that the Russ Jekyll and George Brower and others came in to being, developed this whole system that became so efficient, it needed capital and management. Ha <laughs> ha, capital and management to put up the buildings and keen management to know how to raise pork in this effort. Little did we realize that those people on the other side of the ledger that had been processors could now see this vertical integration in owning everything from the first squeal to the meal. They could see it because they had outside capital and they gained their effort and their objective with the hard sweat and tears of George Brown and, and Russ Jekyll and others then have followed through later on. Tell me a little bit about uh, George Brower and, 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 and Russ Jekyll and, and how important they were to you in... Uh... Each of them had this innate desire with the skill of innovation and to follow through with an idea into reality of what was essential to create and develop a facility 
and I'm using the word facility now in that of a building or a series of buildings to house animals without straw, without the kind of, quote, comfort we've grown up with, with deep bedding to concrete with heat, with air movement, mechanically developed air movement, fans. They had to develop all of these things and find a way with the right slope of the floor, the right kind of floor for penetration of the waste. So many, many different things that they would try something, but then they'd grin and say, now if you do this, make sure you, make sure you buy a, 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 a jackhammer to make a change if you need to because you're going to have to make a change. So with that new building comes a jackhammer to, to remodel. That's the sort of thing. That's only one aspect. Then the genetics. You need an animal with the kind of footage and the kind of bone structure to withstand this concrete floor. You needed nutrition. You didn't have sunlight. You had to feed the animals the grain that you grew, the protein you grew, and certain and other additives as vitamins and minerals. So that's not only a balanced ration, but a perfectly balanced ration for those conditions. And then came the other important thing as time started changing, marketing skills. You had to have marketing skills. In the old system, you, you failed twice a year. And we knew that the high price for pork was going to be in December. No longer because they were farrowing year round. So this was a whole new book to be written. And I'm saying these early authors were farmers because they were the only ones known. Well, what happened to the hog business so that you're, by, by the 90s you had that uh, uh, drop in prices? What, what led to that? Well, that's where I was wrong. I didn't think that big business could ever follow the poultry business in pork, but they did. 1998, hogs went to $8 a hundred. It cost at that time close to probably $35 a hundred to produce them. So it was a dramatic, dramatic loss in the cost of production to what you could get for the live animals. We lost a good many, hundreds and thousands of pork producers because of economic loss. And with that loss then came a greater ownership by maybe five producers. Smithfield was, is the largest today. Smithfield was Smithfield, Virginia. We first knew them as Virginia hams and they now have uh, a great foothold on ownership of the hog, as I mentioned, from squeal to meal. Others have followed suit. And, uh, and uh, this, this has uh, created a whole different pattern for the farmer. Remember, as I took Ag Ec 1 at the university back in 1940 and 41, a farmer was responsible for labor, capital, and management. Labor, capital, and management. And now today, if you sign a contract, then your labor, capital, partly. You don't own the hogs anymore. You're going to own the building. Management, no. You're no longer management. You're told what to do and when to do it. You see, this takes me back to... Uh, takes me back to uh, a time of not only seeing how communists work, but some of the things that they do. And I was out in uh, southern Siberia, 1978, talking with a farm manager through an interpreter. I said, how in the world do you manage 50,000 acres? He says, very simple. Moscow tells me when, how, who's going to help me, how much I want to receive for the product, and to make a profit. Impossible for me to make a profit. Everything else, I'm told what to do, so I do it. 
So now, as an example, I was sitting in a group of 50 at a certain setting here in Illinois, Central Illinois. And the speaker was Smithfield, a representative of Smithfield. And we were told, now when he speaks, if you have a question, raise your hand. Don't hold a question. And within a few seconds, he said, in order to guarantee to the consumer today quality of pork and quantity of pork, you have to have vertical integration. Well, that turned my old mind back to what I'd seen before in Europe, and I immediately raised my hand. And he said, yes. What's your question? I said, first of all, am I correct in believing that you said, in order to guarantee to the public, the consuming public, quality and quantity of production, you had to have vertical integration? That's right. I said, then, would you please explain to this audience, and the audience made up of the Dean of College of Agriculture, uh, heads of agricultural commodity groups, farm organizations, and others. I said, would you explain to this group why a pork producer should sign a contract with you, which is the very system that proved to be a total failure in the old Soviet Union? His answer, because that's the only thing that'll work. Now, I had two great disappointments. Number one, his, his selfish explanation of why this was good for Smithfield without even considering the producer, only as a means to the end. And the other disappointment I had is that no one else in the room challenged him. This is a miracle. I believe so fervently in our country. I am so grateful to be an American. I am so thankful that those creators of our Constitution, based upon the Declaration of Independence, and when you read the Declaration of Independence, those skillful minds very meticulously and carefully and thoroughly describe the conditions living under the British. The excess taxation, the cruelty, the mistreatment, and they were determined that this was going to come to an end and they were going to create a new nation. So they fought the Revolutionary War. And when you read the statistics, more than 50% of the people were opposed to that war. And I say that with a smile because I've said this too. Who the Sam Hill wants to go to war? You know, that's the worst thing a person can do is go to war because you're taught as a youngster you don't shoot someone else unless it's for personal defense. So I had a learning curve when I went into uniform. When you came but that down. learning curve was simply but emphatically this, this. The freedom I inherited had to be protected. And if I can help, I'm going to. For some reason in that training, and I will correlate this to the, to the last question. The correlation of that training to convince you the will to win because it's for your country, your family, and for the future of freedom. And I wanted to go. And so when I sat in that audience, many years later, this audience of civilians, this audience of agriculturalists, this audience of the competitive enterprise system, that I inherited, and all of us in that room inherited. And here's a person who is defying that for corporate business purposes. That's the only way it'll work. Fiddlesticks. Because American farm families in the previous years had proven 
that our productivity was second to no one in the whole world but America was number one. And now along comes deep pockets, a selfish attitude, and set their own rules. That's called the golden rule. We got the gold and we're setting the rules. And I am not about to kneel to that. But it's fast leaving our society. Hogs now are approximately about 90% owned by corporations. We're out of the hog business. We sold our operation to four fellows that are going to try to make it, and I hope they do. And the same thing is true with some other species of livestock and now getting into grain. Contract grain selling. Ah, to me that's taking the lifeblood out of agriculture. When you talk to, back to the armed forces, back to the drill sergeant, back to the generals, General Eisenhower as an example, what's the number one soldier? A farm boy because they learn the ethic of work. They learn how to make do with what you have. They learn that there's certain skills of creation, creativity, innovation, and not many professions outside of agriculture requires that of each person because it's, it's more of a tunnel. If you're a lawyer, you're a lawyer. If you're a, a life, if you're a, a life insurance salesman, you're a life insurance salesman. If you're an engineer, you're an engineer. A farmer is so broad, and I'm not saying that other people aren't important, not at all. I'm just saying we were blessed to grow up on a farm where you had to make do with what you had, and you had to be innovative and skillful and accomplish so many different skills. And the only way you can do this is you're born and raised on a farm with a few exceptions. The industrialization of farming, that's what you're, you're, you're talking about. What do you see, how do you see that affecting farming going forward in the future? Well, it's changed a lot. Uh, my dad went, well, first of all, when you look in a museum, I have some hand corn planters. You plant one hill at a time. Bam, bam. Today, there's a 36-row corn planter going six and, six and a half miles an hour across the field. Wow, wow, a combine will come in with 12 row header. Wow, it used to be by hand an year at a time. The industrial revolution made it possible for the agricultural revolution. How far will it go? We were talking about that the other day. To those of us who remember picking corn by hand, and I didn't pick very much by hand, but some, to seeing a two-row corn planter with two horses, yes. Cultivate one row of corn at a time, yes. And now, so much productivity. One person, his wife can do 1,000, 1,500 acres. Skill in management. It will go further. The GPS system from the Defense Department. Turn the tractor around that plow. You, the neighbor has it. You can see that row, and there's not one even one little twiggle in it. It's just as straight as a die. Combine so efficient. And how much more will go? Only imagination can can see. A few years ago on Prairie Farmer, Prairie Farmer magazine, the top, front cover, State of Illinois. He had four lines, as I recall. Four farms in Illinois. Can there be four farms in Illinois? Well, when we read about what's going down in, in, uh, in South America, in Brazil, it's not unusual for them to own 350,000 acres. A person, 350,000 acres. Can they go more? We all expect they can. How is it possible? Careful management, a source of credit, reliable source of credit, 
certainly some key people. Does this put this into the hands of people you're concerned about, though? You bet. You bet. Well, you've heard of what I've said about hogs. To me, that's, that is catastrophe. It's going to be a worse catastrophe for grain. Who's going to own the land? Remember, labor, capital, and management? You end up being labor. They tell you what to do. They want to use your skill as a manager until you have developed for them another shortcut then they're going to cut you out and use that shortcut with, with fewer people. They meaning top-down management. They mean, I'm saying, the old Soviet Union system. In America, that is not within the confines of our Constitution. We do not have that possibility so far as laws are concerned because in the executive branch of federal government, prevent monopolies. And there's t teeth in the laws. There's teeth in the procedures. In GIPSA, under the USDA, there are those individuals that are responsible to prevent some of these things happen. And they're not following through, either Democrat or Republican. Why? We don't read about it. We don't hear about it from the universities. We don't read it in the paper. We don't hear about it from our politicians. You have to find out for yourself. I say, bad, bad, bad. Why? Again, that's not what I learned. That's not what I was taught. You know, I was also taught, you believe your preacher. You believe your teacher. You believe the judge. And you don't challenge them because they are beyond being challenged because of their honor. Not so anymore. Saw a difference when I came back from World War II. Saw a difference when I went to church. And I found out shortly that I had to challenge that person behind the pulpit. I found I had to challenge the dean of the College of Agriculture. Why aren't you telling this to we the people? Because Abraham Lincoln signed into law the land-grant college system during the depths of the Civil War. The initial penetration was to permit more and more underprivileged to go for higher education. Thank you, Abraham. Wise, the land-grant college system. Following that came the extension service to spread to the farmers a better way to be more productive and improvement in procedures. Marvelous. But now, the farmer isn't the high priority, the number one client of the College of Agriculture. It's not the number one client. It's the person over there in these select offices where they built new facilities on Urbana Champaign campus. I don't speak about the rest of the university. I'm saying to agriculture. That's what I'm most acquainted with. With all due respect to professors with all that are there for purpose, that are not selfish purpose. Because we read about certain professors there for selfish purpose, that are not within the Constitution, freedom of speech. But honesty has to be part of freedom of speech, or it shouldn't be permitted. In the olden days, you hung from the oak tree till dead for treason for some of the things that are going on today. You said that when you came out of the service, that you had this desire to help, to, to be part of a, a bigger picture. Um, when you, what was the, 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 the start of your involvement with the Farm Bureau? In a county Farm Bureau. I remember I was right out by the shop on this sunny day. And my neighbor, about three miles away, Dutch Pearson, drove in. And he said, Harold, it's your turn. I said, my turn for what? Represent Dover Township on the county board, Farm Bureau. 
What do you mean, Dutch, my turn? He says, because I'm retiring and I'm saying you're, you should take my place. And I said, well, who's going to decide that? He said, I'll put your name in and the membership will decide. The membership will vote. If they vote for you, you're in. If they don't, somebody else will be in. But I'm saying, I'd like for you to permit me to put your name in. So that was probably about 19, in the 50s. Well, it so happened that the Dutch, as he looked to the future and decided that he'd served long enough, he was looking around for a candidate and picked me and I, what happened? And so I then uh, served on the board and served through the chairs and became county president. And then in uh, 1970, there was a vacancy of vice president in the state. And uh, Greg had just gotten back from Vietnam. He was a squad leader, light infantry in Vietnam. The, the helicopter would take Greg and his men into the jungle area, drop them off, helicopters in there, they're by themselves. He had tough duty. Well, he just got back. I said, Greg, there's going to be an opening for vice president. I said, I want your input here. I said, you're, you know, you, you went to Vietnam. You went into training. You've been gone two years. And now you're back. Uh, you were just not too long out of high school when you left. And uh, you went a couple years college and you're drafted I said as for vice president if I'm lucky if I'm elected I'll only be gone maybe you know three or four days a month for the meeting and some other duties well, I said sure go ahead that so I put my hat in the ring and I think there were five of us that were candidates for vice president and I happened to hit the lucky cord and I was elected vice president. Well, that was in November of 1970. In December, Bill Koopas was president of the Illinois Farm Bureau and Charlie Schumann was president of the American Farm Bureau. And at the annual meeting, Mr. Schumann surprised us all by saying, I am resigning as of this meeting I have another year in my tenure, but I'm decided that it's best that I resign now. Uh, I have other things to do, and this is my decision. And it was like a storm cloud, boom. So we hustled the forces together and nominated Bill Koufos to take Charlie's place. And I gave the nomination, and Mr. Kubis became the new president of the American. I haven't even been in the boardroom yet at uh, IAA until that convention was over. We came back for meetings, and the board then had the authority to name me then as president. So my first meeting was being in the boardroom the first time, and now I'm president. So it happened. So I said, Greg, things have changed. I'm going to be full-time now. So this put a big load on his shoulders of taking over the operation of, we had a hog confinement unit. Not too much confinement at that time, we were just getting involved with it. And uh, so he took over the farm, and now he's farmed longer than I have. Who were your duties as president? It's one of the most uh, complicated structures that one could imagine. And I. I, I, I want to answer you two ways. The duties was, first of all, chairman of the board. And the board, the board meets every month, generally three days a month. Uh, I was also chief executive officer. And the Farm Bureau in Illinois has several affiliated companies, quite a number of affiliated companies, uh, including the country insurance company, holding company, uh, 
then other companies, uh, Prairie Farms is, a, is affiliated with Growmark, we have a responsibility there. And, uh, and uh, uh, the oldest company is the auditing company. And at the time I was there, we also had a livestock affiliated company that's gone now. So there's, it, it's, 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 a, it's a diverse organization, but each of these companies, each of these affiliated companies are there for one purpose, and that's to serve the farmer member. Serve the farmer member. That's really the marching order. Serve the farmer member. And there are 18 IAA board members, very, very dedicated to the organization, dedicated to the business of agriculture, and through their skills, individual skills, they too then have been selected from the people in their district to represent that district and then to the whole state of, of the organization and its responsibilities. Uh, then also I served as a member of the American Farm Bureau Federation Board of Directors. Um, that board uh, again is selected through, re we have four regions, this is the Midwest regions of 12 states. And I, I would say it's very important. The Farm Bureau structure is much like our political structure in America. It's a representative form of government that we have a representative form. So if we're unhappy with our representative or our senator, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Who are we picking? Who are we voting for? Do we know who we're voting for? Farm Bureau, representative structure. As a whole, the IA board is a whole responsible for the state. The same in Washington, the Senate and the House, responsible for the nation. To their elected the electorate, yes, but America under the Constitution. Farm Bureau has its Constitution, has its, its very much its marching orders, its procedure, what it believes in as determined by the delegate body. Very similar, and that's the reason I felt so strongly about it. That organization works for, number one, the client, the farmer. On a personal basis, uh, that meant you having to, to uh, spend a lot of time down in Bloomington. Full time. Absolutely full time. And I, and I could, couldn't have done it had it not been for Marjorie and Greg. Couldn't have. Just couldn't. Marjorie stayed here. She, she's, uh, we, we created eventually a farmer, a, a family corporation. And uh, she was secretary treasurer. Greg was the is the managing partner and uh, again their skills are tremendous and uh, that's the way it's gone and uh, as I say Greg has farmed longer than I have. How, how many years were you uh, were you uh, president of uh, IAA? Uh, 13. 13. 13 years. If, if I could ask you to name those things that you feel were the legacy of your presidency, what would they be? When I went there, I got a feel of the responsibility. I would correlate to what I felt as a farmer and as a county president some changes that need to be made. One was information. At that time, we had a monthly publication. We meaning the Farm Bureau in Illinois. And I talked with the information director, and I said, his name was Bill Allen. I said, Bill, we need to, we need to enhance this. Once a month isn't enough communication with the farmer. Things are going on too rapidly. There's too much activity. We need to create some kind of a, a publicity, a, a publication that's more frequent with up-to-date news, with up-to-date challenges, with up-to-date information. And he beamed. He said, hey, good for you. I've been thinking about that a long time. Let's do it. 
So we have farm week. It didn't happen that quickly. But there was a skill of a staff person that had been thinking of from his personal responsibility where I've been thinking of it as a farmer. Another one, marketing. I was all of a sudden realized that that December high of time for hogs was no longer true and I wasn't doing a poor job marketing. But we converted all of our grain into meat, feeding cattle, feeding lamb, but mainly pork. So, Dale Butts. Dale Butts, we know that Butts name from Earl, who was Secretary of Agriculture. Earl, Dale was the youngest brother. Uh, Dale, Dale came into Farm Bureau in marketing. He'd been with, got his PhD in economics. And I talked some of these things about Dale, and he beamed. He said, yes, we, there's lots of room. We need to, we need to develop a system where farmers can sell in the upper fourth of the market rather than the bottom quarter of the market. So he, and of course, all these things go to the board and many things go to the delegate body. The next thing, the next thing I looked about is leadership. I'd mentioned the Army. And people have said, what's the most important thing that's happened to you in developing years? And I thought of grade school, high school, university, and the Army. Army. They taught me. They drummed into me. Many, many things in the way of leadership. Pride of country. Oh, they didn't say you have to, but it's the leadership that caused you to recognize why they had dedicated their lives to the armed forces, to protect the freedom, protect the freedom. I was reminded me of a youngster, little village of Dover, quarter of a mile away. As a youngster, on Saturday, my buddies had come down, and after the harvest, the straw stack was out there. We played King of the Hill. Not when Dad saw us, you understand, because you stayed off there. The King of the Hill, who can be on top of that straw stack? Everybody else going to push you off. Just one King of the Hill. And I've thought of that many times since. America is king of the hill in the world. We're the only one that has a kind of government where the people are the objective. Number one, freedom of the people, a will to win, a system where you can, in agriculture, get rich or go broke. The risk is with you, but you have that opportunity of risk. That's the thing that stuck with me in the Army, a will to win with a mission, and that's protecting that freedom. Now, along comes that vertical integration. We'll tell you what to do. Uh-uh. That violates the very principles of people who give their lives for their country. Did you ever have to come head-to-head -head with that kind of a, a, a system when you were president of IAA? 